welcome there, Daylight Burners. Howdy, howdy, howdy. How the fuck are you? Hope everybody had a great weekend and uh, you're all doing okay. So, I'm going to try something just a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to do another history podcast for you. I'm going to do it while horseback and we'll see how it goes. Miss Clara, every time I try to record on horseback, I, I swear, as soon as I start, she starts trying to take a leak, and it's not real cool. But anyhow, I'm going to put you back on my chest harness here and uh, and get started with this thing. So bear with me. I think you might like this one. Um, I don't know if you like the format or not. Oh, get your feet there, sis. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Anyhow. So, today I'm going to tell you the story, once again, of one of the last Old West outlaws. And, uh, well, Blackjack Ketchum had some notoriety and, uh, and had some um, familiarity among uh, different different groups of people. Uh, this guy was far more famous after he died and well after he died uh, than he ever was while he was alive. So uh, this is going to be the story of one Elmer McCurdy. M-C-C-U-R-D-Y. Elmer McCurdy. So before we get on into that, I got to tell you about Loma Livestock because they're helping helping me keep this whole shit wagon afloat. And uh, they uh, they provide a vital service for me in the form of form of advertising dollars. So, uh, you know George Raptopoulos. You know him well. You've heard him on here several times. But he is a proud owner and operator of Loma Livestock. They're in Loma, Colorado. They're located at 1369 12 and a half Road. And uh, they've got a sale going every Wednesday with the cows and singles starting at 10 o'clock, followed by the feeders and the bigger bunches at 11. Uh, they're pretty well the best best sale barn out there. Uh particularly in, in Western Colorado. They're one of the only ones. And uh, they do a hell of a good job. Uh, you can also uh, view their, their sales online. And uh, to do that, you got to go over to LomaLivestock.com. If you'd like to consign or you got any questions for them, uh, you can also give them a holler at 970-858-9988. And... Uh, you know, more than anything, just go go check out a sale uh, and let them know that uh, you heard about it on Burning Daylight. So thanks, George, and uh, thanks, Loma Livestock. Also, we've got Mr. Nick Allen Lute uh, with his braided rawhide Hondas that he's making and selling, uh, or he's trying to sell anyways. So uh, you should go check him out. Uh, if you see right here, I've got one of his Hondas on my rope. And uh, if you look at this rope, it's a little bitty 5 uh diameter. It uh, runs pretty hot, pretty fast, but it's also very lightweight. So uh, in the wind, it's next to useless until you put one of these bad boys on there. Put some weight. And you can also... You can also reach way on out with uh, with that extra weight and, and throw some really, really cool loops. Uh, they're also tougher in nails, and uh, he's never had one break on, on him, so you probably won't either. But if you do, just send it back. He'll, uh, he'll build you a new one. Um, you can find him on Facebook, Nick Allen Lute, L-U-T-E, or on Instagram, at Will Cowboy for Food. Uh, W-I-L-L Cowboy F-O-R Food All one word 
And uh, you can check them out there. Send them a message if you'd like to have him build you something. He makes one like these. Makes the San Joaquin style. And then he makes one similar to the San Joaquin style, but it's got a, it's a braided neck on it, too. So uh, let him know. If you heard about him on uh, Burning Daylight, he'll uh, cut you a little discount. Great dude. Uh, thanks for supporting the show, Nick. And go check him out. Get yourself a Honda. Try it out. I think you'll like him. So let's talk about the the saga, the tale from the crypt, if you will, of one Elmer McCurdy. Elmer McCurdy was born in Maine in uh, 1880. And uh, he uh, he started out kind of doomed to have much of a, uh, a normal life right from the get-go. So I wasn't able to find a whole lot of details about his mother. Um, but from the story that I found, she sounds like she was a bit of a whore, whether a literal whore or just uh, kind of a floozy. I don't know. But she she gave birth to Elmer, our, uh, I don't know if we call him a protagonist, but he's the main character in this story. I don't know if he's, uh, I will call him a protagonist and an antagonist. Um, if we go back to uh, literary class, English class in high school, uh, this would be a case of man versus man. And because uh, he, uh, he was not a very good outlaw. Or he, uh, he's not very good at being an outlaw, I guess. Um, so right off the bat, his mom gives birth to him and she is not sure who the father is. So rather than having him be raised as a bastard child, uh, <clears throat> she hands him over to her, her, uh, her sister and her husband to, to raise him as their own. So therefore he doesn't have the stigma of being a bastard for the rest of his life. Well, apparently she can't, can't live with herself. And at the age of about 13, I believe she, uh, she spills the beans and said, Hey, this lady that you've been calling mommy, she's my sister, you know, but, uh, she's actually not your mommy. I am. And uh, I'm sorry, son, but I'm not real for sure who, uh, whose seed, uh, sprouted you had a had a lot of dicks thrown my way apparently and uh not sure which one is uh the cause of you but um I'm your mama hey and obviously kind of fucked this fella up in a in a pretty bad way and uh he basically becomes a raging alcoholic in his teenage years and that carries over with him up until the day of his death in 1911. So he uh, he develops a pretty pretty nasty drinking problem at a very early age. But you know, for the first part of his life, he was uh, uh, fairly well addressed, adjusted. Just had a severe drinking problem. So he becomes an apprentice plumber. And was doing pretty well until the economic downturn of about 1890. And, uh, not 1890, about 1900, I guess. And, uh, and he loses his job. And so he kind of bounces around the Eastern seaboard, uh, doing some odd work. Uh, he was a lead miner at one point. Uh, he's a plumber still. And finally he, uh, he joins the, the army and he gets stationed at Fort Leavenworth there in Kansas, eastern Kansas. And uh, where he is trained, although it sounds like 
uh, his training was not very good, or maybe he was just a bad student. I don't know, but he got trained in explosives. He was a machine gunner, uh, but also was trained in explosives. Probably not very well, or like I said, it just didn't take because he was a dum dum, as you'll come to find out. <laughs> so anyway, he serves four years in the army, gets uh, honorably discharged, and uh, now he's living uh, around Kansas, Oklahoma area. And uh, and this is kind of where he uh, he tries his hand at being an outlaw and robbing trains and banks and. Uh, <laughs> With a lot of uh, a lot of attempts and also a lot of failures, and even the ones he was successful on, uh, were 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 not all that damn successful. So he uh, he uh, has a crew. I don't know if they're always the same people. Probably not. Imagine anybody that worked with him one time decided this guy is a fucking idiot and uh. They just uh, don't include him on their next deal. So there's one time he uh, they rob a train, and he's the explosives guy. So he's you know pretty vital part when you're robbing a train because you got to blow open a safe. And uh, so he gets a whole bunch of nitroglycerin. He uh, he blows the safe, but he uh, miscalculates uh, how much he needs and way overdoes it. And he t- turned about four grand worth of silver into just a, m- a smoldering melted blob <laughs> from th- from this explosion of uh, cracking the safe. So silver coins <laughs> all melted into this blob. And, you know, so four grand, that's pretty pretty good chunk of change. Nowadays, even, it's a pretty good chunk of change. But in those days, you know, that's, you know, kind of a, a small to mid-sized fortune. And uh, I, I don't know how they, uh, if they melted it back down into bars or what, but they, uh, <laughs> they, they get away with just a melted blob of silver worth about 4,000. Uh, on another occasion, they try to rob a bank. And this guy, he, uh, he is trying like hell to get the fuse lit. Uh, doesn't get it done, and uh, the lookout man gets a little nervous and I uh, say, "Hey, we got to get the fuck out of here." Uh, you know, it's broad daylight. We're robbing a bank, and uh, yeah, you can't even get the damn uh, safe open. So they they finally bail, and they end up just taking the uh, whatever coins they could find that weren't in the safe, and end up being about a hundred and fifty bucks. So. Uh, and, and also, I mean, think about that $150 worth of coins. That's, uh, I just picture the episode of Seinfeld where Kramer's, uh, trying to pay with everything in pennies and he's wearing cargo pants <laughs> with the pockets just filled with pennies. That's kind of what I'm picturing with, uh, with this case. Cause you know, there had to have been a, a whole bunch of pennies in there as well. I'm into sure those sorted coins, but. It's a, it's a lot of coins for uh, <laughs> to pack around. So uh, once again, a bungled attempt. Uh, they did have some successes, I guess, but they were pretty far and few, a few and far between. And uh, and this whole time, you know, he's uh, he's kind of doing some odd jobs around too, but he can never keep a job very long just because he's such a blackout drunk all the time and uh so on the day he meets his maker in 1911 there is uh it is known that there is a i, I don't know if it was known or if it was suspected but there was rumor that this train was coming through uh with a royalty payment headed to the osage indian nation of four hundred thousand dollars on that train, and so him and his crew, they are going to—they're going to rob this train, and they're going to make out like the bandits that they are. And uh, you know, four hundred grand, even in today's terms, that's a lot of fucking money. And uh, there was one problem with this whole shebang, 
is uh, whether they read the the train schedule wrong, or uh, the rumor was wrong, or whatever, they robbed the wrong train. Instead, they uh, they end up robbing a, a passenger train. Nice little stop there, Clara. And uh, they shake everybody down, and they end up with a coat, a watch, a Colt revolver, two bottles of whiskey, and forty-two dollar or forty-six dollars is what they make make off with. So they uh, they shake all these people down. I think they found some like random jewelry and shit from the passengers, but all in all. Nowhere near the four hundred thousand that they uh, they were expecting, and in no way, shape, or form could you call that a successful train robbery. Well, I mean, technically they did rob the train and uh, get away, but no, no, because he didn't. So he he makes it back to his buddies. Uh, ranch that he's been hiding out at. The guy's been letting him stay in his hay shed. And so he uh, he takes the two bottles of whiskey and uh, the, you know the rest of his gang split up. And uh, I don't know if he made off with any of the money. I'm sure they're uh, at that point, they're just like, fuck it, you keep the whiskey. We're taking this little bit of cash. Uh, so he, he goes back to this, this hay barn and he gets good and drunk, but little do they know, or little does he know that uh, the the authorities, the law dogs, they they know about this this train robbery, and they know that he was part of it, and they know that he's hanging out in this hay shed. So he wakes up the next morning, I'm sure with just a rage and fucking hangover. I don't. I guess I don't know. I. Uh, do do those real bad drunks like that? Do they still get hangovers, or is it just kind of? I don't know. Anyways, he uh, he wakes up and he's got uh, three sheriffs and a posse surrounding this barn, and they you know they tell him to come on out with his hands up. They know it's you, Elmer, and uh, well, he starts shooting at him. Uh, doesn't doesn't injure anybody. Uh, but somehow in the fray, they they end up killing killing poor old dumb dumb Elmer McCurdy, and he uh, he was later found to, to have died from a single gunshot wound to the chest. Um, some of the sheriffs knew which one had shot him, or the you know the sheriff or their posse. Um, but anyway, case closed on this uh, passenger train robbery, and. Uh, you know, he uh, he got what he had coming, I guess. So there we are, Elmer McCurdy, uh, lifelong drunk, lifelong loser, and uh, just all around kind of kind of just a poor sap of a fella. Ends up dead and. Uh, where did he die at? Osage Hills, Oklahoma. And he was the age of 31. But that's not where this story ends. <clears throat> not even close. So... They uh, they take his body into town, and the coroner, Undertaker, he uh, he embalms him, and they used uh, back in those days, um, they used an arsenic-based uh, embalming agent to uh, to preserve the body, and they uh, and they use this a lot of times uh, for for folks that didn't have any close next to kin to claim the body, you know, uh, that, that were right there. So a lot of these drifters and outlaw types, uh, when they would, when they'd get taken into the undertaker, they'd, they'd pump them full of this arsenic stuff that kept them in good shape, uh, you know, visually for quite some time so that they could, uh, 
they could leave them there in their shop, prop them up uh, in the window or in the corner or something, so that in the off chance somebody might know who this is and they can come claim the body. Well, time passes and nobody uh, nobody claims him. And uh, so this old boy, he's like, well, he's just taking up room, so I might as well might as well make some use of him. So he dresses him up in a real frontier outlaw type outfit, puts the rifle in his hand, and he props him up in the window of his shop. And he just kind of became a sideshow piece. And uh, not a side piece, he perverts, a sideshow piece. And he would charge people a, a nickel to take a closer look at this at this dude. And... Uh, the funny part about it, uh, it's morbid as hell, but it's kind of funny, is uh, how they would pay is they would stick a nickel in this guy's mouth. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I imagine you've got to have a pretty dark, twisted sense of humor to, uh, to be an undertaker in the first place. Um, but, man, that, that kind of takes the, takes the cake. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they, uh, for whatever reason, this old boy, he decides, oh, I'm going to charge you a nickel if you want to get up there and, uh, and see what a real life dead body looks like, have at it. It's going to cost you a nickel and you got to put it in his mouth. Well, one day, these two old boys show up at the Undertaker's place and he, uh, and they're marveling at this, uh, at this uh, cadaver there in the corner or in the in the window, and they uh, they tell this old undertaker this long drawn out story about how one of them is uh, a long lost cousin, and the other one is uh, old poor old Elmer's brother, and they uh, somehow convince the authorities that that's who they were, and. Um, so they were able to collect poor old Elmer's body. And uh, there there goes a uh, nice little side income for Mr. Undertaker Man. But, you know, it was a good run while it lasted. So he uh, he hands him over this, uh, this embalmed uh, drunk. And uh, that should have been in the story, but it wasn't. Because these two fellas, if you haven't uh, haven't figured out by now from the tone of my voice, were not any kin at all to poor old Elmer. They were actually owners of a traveling carny. They they were carnival owners, just a couple of no good carnies, and uh, they had heard about this Elmer fella from somebody. And they thought, well, hey, that'd be a good thing to add to our already weird freak show exhibits. And uh, so they, once they collected him from the undertaker there in Osage Hills, he uh, he goes on the road. And uh, and this was in 1921 when uh, when he hits the road. And they take him all over the country. To uh, to just be uh, a piece in the sideshow, and uh, over the years his condition deteriorated, and uh, but he was he traveled all over the country. I mean, as just they were a traveling carnival, circus, freak show, sideshow, whatever you want to call them. Uh, there was, you know, they they all had uh, they, they they showed him all over the place. He was actually in a movie, uh, I think it was in like the 30s, like 38 or something like that, um, where he was filmed at uh, Mount Rushmore. And in this process, he, uh, well, I'll get to that part later. But anyway, he uh, he bounces around from, from them, that, that carnival company. They, uh, they get sold and... Uh, and another another outfit takes ownership of uh, poor old Elmer McCurdy. 
And uh, and then he kind of goes radio silent. And then one day, and I believe, let me get the date right, but I believe it was in 1978. Let's look that up real quick, right? Right here. Um, 1976. He was uh, he was rediscovered during the filming of an episode uh, of the Six Million Dollar Man, and in this episode, you know, the Six Million Dollar Man was fighting this evil German uh, supervillain in a like house of horrors, like a carnival funhouse or something like that. And so they were using this prop of like a mummied body. Uh, it was covered in like uh, fluorescent paint and they put a noose on him. And so he was just like swinging. Uh, it was kind of like a house of horrors type situation. And uh, well, they swing this body down and, uh, and everybody's thinking this is just a regular old Hollywood prop. And, uh, but it's in bad shape and the arm gets popped off. And you're like, oh, well, go get us another, another prop. And then, so one of the, one of the crew on this filming that took a look at this severed arm and they say, Hey, there's a bone in here. And, uh, it looks like there's some muscle tissue too. And so they call the cops and the cops come over and they look at it and say, well, I'll be damned. That is damn sure a, uh, a human arm. So rather than take them directly to the, to the coroner, uh, no, they, uh, they, they call the paramedics and they report a case of extreme dehydration because basically at this point, he's uh he's a piece of jerky. <laughs> And they, uh, they, they call up and, uh, to these paramedics and, uh, they say, yeah, we got a, we got a guy over here at this, uh, this house of horrors, um, need to take a look at He's, he is very, very, very dehydrated. Uh, they didn't mention the fact that this guy was dead and long dead. Um, so they, they show up and they're like, what the fuck? And had a good laugh of it. They take it to the the coroner, and so they uh, they start, you know, removing the paint and and the noose that they I think they had somehow like threaded the noose through his uh, through his body somehow. Anyway, they they take all that. They find the the original gunshot wound. Uh, they don't find the the bullet. Uh, they, assume that thing had probably been removed during the initial embalming. They found all the <laughs> the original embalming scars and, and whatnot. They had no idea who this who this fellow was. <clears throat> and uh and and at this point the body was in really bad shape because uh as they later found out because they found a nineteen twenty eight penny and a admissions ticket for this carnival in uh, poor old Elmer's mouth. Uh, this dude, even in death, cannot catch a break. You know, he, he stands up in this, in the window of this undertaker's shop, funeral home, I guess is what we'd call him now. <laughs> and, uh, and he's got people putting quarters down his mouth. And then he gets sold to a bunch of carnies. And they take him all over the country doing God knows what, because uh, as uh, if you remember the the episode with uh, Mr. James Blocker, who was a carny for one day, uh, or no, like a week, I guess is what what he was a carny for. Uh, carnies are kind of they're they're not the the most savory of characters. They're a little weird, a little out there. And a lot of times, uh, the reason they're a carny is that the only job they can do probably would have been a good job in real life for uh, Elmer McCurdy rather than an outlaw. Um, but <clears throat> he gets to live out his uh, his fullest potential in uh, in the afterlife. 
as a as a sideshow. And so they they find a 1928 penny and a admissions ticket to to this uh, carnival company, who's you know now defunct, but they were able to they were able to, to call up some relatives of the people that used to own this, and they uh, they confirmed that this was indeed the the corpse of of one Elmer McCurdy, a <laughs> failed bank robber, train robber. Uh, I guess he succeeded in being an outlaw because outlaw means that you have broken the law and you're on the run, I guess. So in that part, he was successful, but as a, as a thief, uh, he was just not very good at it. It sounds like really the only thing he was good at was drinking a whole lot of booze. Uh, but as I said before, his body was in very, very rough shape. Because uh, at one point they he was filmed at a movie uh, at Mount Rush, Rushmore, and apparently at the time they uh, when they took him over there instead of like putting him in a trailer or in the back of a of a van or whatever they they had they just strapped him to the top of this truck like a, a Christmas tree you know think of. Uh, National Lampoon's family or, or Christmas vacation, you know, when they've got that giant fucking tree strapped to the 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 hood of the fam or the the roof of the family truckster. <laughs> That's about how this poor old outlaw was uh, strapped to the top of who knows what kind of truck it was. I'm sure it was some sort of Ford, uh, you know, early model Ford with like the the wood and wagon wheels and whatever. <laughs> He, uh, but he, he survived a windstorm, but he didn't come out unscathed. Like they, it took the tips of his ears off, it took his nose, uh, took uh, most of his fingers and toes, and he was just really in bad shape after that. And then somehow ends up in this uh, this uh, funhouse scene in Hollywood, and uh, it was just a really really kind of fucked up story all the way around. Uh, people are weird. Uh, anyhow, they, the authorities there in, in Los Angeles County, they, uh, they find out this is indeed poor old Elman McCurdy. He's got, of course, no, no surviving family. Um, nothing of the sort. So finally the town of Guthrie, Oklahoma, they say, well, we'll give him a proper burial. And so they they ship his body off to Guthrie, Oklahoma, and he gets buried right next to Bill Doolin, I think was his name, was also a, an, uh, an outlaw of the time in the, the Guthrie Boot, Boot Hill Cemetery. <laughs> and to, uh, to put a final nail in the, in the coffin, you know, pun intended, of... Uh, Elmer's wild saga. They uh, they bury him under two foot of concrete, so that nobody will ever dig him up again. So that is the wild, crazy, uh, almost kind of unbelievable story of Elmer McCurdy. He was a failure at life he was a failure as a uh as a thief and uh and out well not an outlaw i guess he he succeeded in being an outlaw but he was a he was a failure as a as an explosive person um sounds like maybe the only thing he did properly in his life was uh serve out his full full four-year term in the army but for a fellow that could never put down the bottle and never do anything right, he uh, he had a little bit of notoriety after he died as a sideshow. So um, a little weird piece of Americana history for you. Uh, in the, the very last days of the American West and all the way to a major Hollywood uh, Hollywood set.
you know, it wasn't a movie, but it was, uh, but it was a, uh, you know, very well-known TV series at the time. And, uh, the guy saw a lot of the country while he was alive. It sounded like, but boy, he saw even more of the country after he died. And, uh, what a wild ride. <laughs> yeah. You robbed the wrong train. And, uh, and the only thing you get out of it is a couple of jugs of whiskey and about 40 bucks. You get shot down and you get embalmed. And the only people that, uh, that claim your body supposedly to give you a burial are people that are just using you as a, as a freak show. And, uh, I, I don't know. I never really gave a whole lot of account of like what this guy's personality was, whether he was like a lovable loser or what. But from what I can tell, nothing that he did in this world uh, was severe enough to deserve that type of treatment in the afterlife. But ah, I guess rest in peace, Elmer. Oh. You know, it was just uh, one of those cases of a, a guy who never could get it together. And uh, it was an interesting read, though. Uh, fascinating, very sad, but hilarious all at the same time. So that's all I got for you today. Uh, I appreciate you tuning in. And uh, before I before I tune out... I uh, I gotta give a big shout out to I'm gonna call him my buddy because I can. It's America. We can say whatever the hell we want. I'm gonna I'm gonna give a big shout out to my buddy Corblon. Um, I'm sure most of you who listen to this have already seen my post, but Corb uh, Corb shared that interview I did on his uh, his Facebook and his Twitter. Uh, and I, I just I, I can't can't say enough nice things about the guy. He is uh he was true to his word all the way through, um, which everyone should be, but you never know when you uh when you meet folks with a large following like that what they're gonna be like. And um I I respect the hell out of Corb because the songs that he writes really speak to a lot of us folks here in rural communities, particularly in, in the Western U S and Canada that live, uh, you know, kind of the cowboy rancher Western lifestyle. You know, he, he writes a lot of songs that, that really speak to us. And, uh, for him to be a, just as, uh, authentic of a person as, uh, his songs sound was, uh, was really, really cool. And so I appreciate him uh, giving me the shout out. He didn't have to do it. He said he would. I never doubted that he would. But then, you know, then you see, I'm, I'm at, currently at the top of his uh, Twitter feed, and uh, besides his uh, pinned post on Facebook, I'm the I'm the first one on there, and uh, pretty damn cool. Uh, that's, a, that's a big moment for me. So I uh, appreciate it, Corb. You're you're a hell of a good dude. And uh, I can't can't wait to, uh, to have you back on. So, anyways, on that note, you know where to find me, Matt McKinley on Facebook, at MickerMac85 on Twitter and Instagram. Show page is Burning Daylight on Facebook and YouTube. Please subscribe and hit the bell on uh, if you're watching on YouTube, so you know when I post something else. Um, we're getting very close to being monetized there as well, so. Um, Please subscribe to that. That'd help me out. And if you like this episode or any other episode I've done, please share it with your friends on social media. Get the word out there. Uh, you know, share it even not on social media. Just tell somebody about it. If you like, if you like what we got going on here, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, and then I'm at move your ass on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. So go follow me, subscribe on, you know, wherever you listen to your podcast, subscribe on YouTube. And, and tell some people about it. I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in. And thanks for uh, 
coming on this wild ride with me and uh rest in peace elmer mccurdy you poor sorry sad sack uh and you know i got some cattle to ride yet so move your ass we're burning daylight <laughs>